Can you hear me okay? Is that better? Yeah. All right, can you see that, Isaac? Um, I can't hear you. So I will introduce you now and then we will kick off and I'll just pull up your video for you when you're ready to go. Thank you. Hi. Welcome back to the second presentation of the day. Um, I really hope you guys got uh, some really great insights to kick off your morning from Michelle from AGL. I thought that was a fantastic presentation and it was great to have her involved in the event. Um, our next presentation is by Fabio Oliveira, who is the Innovation Centre Director at WorkSafe Victoria, and he's going to be discussing all things human-centred transformation and how WorkSafe Victoria has developed a transformation program that adopts client-centred design models and create new products and services. So Fabio, I will hand over to you to kick off your presentation. Uh, you are good to go. Thank you. Thanks, Isaac. Uh, and hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining me this morning. Um, I started WorkSafe uh, three years ago with a mission to establish uh, a new innovation team. And that innovation team came in as an enabler for the new WorkSafe strategy and transformation that, were, that was starting at the time. And our role as an innovation team was to enable that strategy uh, by creating new products and services to leverage the new technology that was coming uh, into the business and it still is. Um, we did a lot of work uh, across prevention and recovery, which is the two sides that WorkSafe operates. And, uh, but I, before I, I start talking a little bit about the work, I just wanna, uh, for those of you who don't know uh, WorkSafe, we are the state's regulator for uh, health and safety in Victoria but also the manager for the workers' compensation scheme. So we operate both on the regulation side and on the insurance side. From We, we have an end-to-end -end view on um, from you know, someone getting injured, but also what caused that injury. And for us, uh, we oversee currently around 2.8 million workers in, in Victoria. And that number is set to increase to more than 4 million by 2030. But there's a lot of things changing uh, in, in terms of work. We, as you all know, you know the gig economy, uh, the aging workforce, new tools and technologies that are changing the, the landscape of workplaces. And that poses a challenge to us, not only to all the workplaces, but also to us as a regulator. Uh, and that's the very own uh, motivation behind the transformation. We know that the environment is gonna change and it's going to put pressure on our uh, regulatory responsibilities, but also on our insurance scheme. And the other aspect is, although those changes are coming to the workplace, we have new technologies, new tools, new industries coming in, like we now, you know, when the uh, most of health and safety started to be uh, discussed, um, we... Uh, were mainly a manufacturing um, state, like we had a lot of work coming from manufacturing. Now, healthcare, education, uh, all new, not new industries, but in terms of new challenge, presenting new challenges to us. But we still see a lot of physical injuries happening. We still see fatalities happening, unfortunately, inside workplaces. And uh, one of the things that it worries us a lot is the increase in mental injuries in the workplace. Uh, currently, 14% of all the claims that we uh, that we have in the in our scheme are um, related to mental injuries, and this number is set to increase by over 30% by 2030. And why that that worries us so much? Because mental injuries take a lot longer for people to recover from and be back at work. So that again uh, puts a lot of pressure in what we do. And WorkSafe vision uh, remains the same. We want to ensure that Victorian workers return home safely every day. And we recognize that we need to do things differently. 
And the story that I uh, want to talk about today and how we apply the human-centric perspective to transformation is related to the uh, recovery space. So recovery, as I said before, is everything from uh, an injury happening all the way to return to work. And the innovation team came in, and although we have worked in other parts of WorkSafe for the last uh, three years, we have worked a lot in the recovery space. And it all started with a very simple brief, uh, creating a new client-centric model that would improve outcomes for injured workers. And we believe our approach to innovation is that there is no innovation if it's not human-centric. You have to start with the people that are experiencing the problem. You have to design with them and for them. And it, for the last three years, uh, we have uh, spoken and tested products uh, with more than 150 injured workers and workers that were not injured, more than 120 employers and healthcare practitioners. Uh, and we um, also have tested more than um, 40 different service um, prototypes, inter interfaces, interactions with the Victorian community. So for us, that means, you know, those numbers uh, are really important because it tells us that we are engaging with people, but more important that uh, the number of people we speak with is the stories behind each one of those experiences that we learn. And that's one of the things that I, I wanna uh, have a chat about today uh, is each one of the workers that we talk to is unique but we constantly, when we talk to injured workers, we see a story that repeats over and over again. Frances here is not a, a real worker, of course, but her story uh, that, you're gonna, that, that you're gonna hear uh, today is very common. It's very similar to many workers that have had an injury in Victoria and very likely in other states in Australia. So uh, a worker like Frances that is 64 years of age, uh, has one child, is a widow, lives on her own, has always worked in legal administration, doing court work, property settlement, conveyancing, suddenly has her life changed by an injury that she suffers at work. Uh, she had a, a role, uh, her role changed. She started, part of her new role was to start carrying heavy mail crates. Uh, she starts to experience some uh, back pain, but is encouraged to continue to work. That happens a lot, sometimes because of stigma, sometimes because the workplace is not ready uh, to uh, understand uh, what an injury is and how to respond to an injury. One day, uh, Frances wakes up and her leg feels like ice. She has to drag herself to the doctor's surgery and she finds out that she got a slip disc and crushed nerves. That's a really uh, serious injury. And she ends up having to do some do surgery and treatment for secondary psychological injuries that are unfortunately common in a lot of people that start with a physical injury, they end up developing secondary mental health injury. But if that wasn't enough, her workplace uh, tries to talk her out of making a claim. And that's a very, one thing that we found that that's a very common thing. Uh, the injury happens, but the time between injury and lodging a claim is very long. So what we found out is uh, after we, we set up the innovation team and we did uh, what are called foundational research is that uh, journeys like Francis were very common, although the type of injury would change. We started to see moments that matter in that journey uh, to be common between different workers. Moments like uh, can I claim? People knowing if they can, if what's their eligibility to claim for an injury. Uh, the second one is the time between an injury and a claim, which happened to Francis in, in our story here. We know that people end up using all their annual leave, their sick leave. Uh, they pay out of pocket for treatment with uh, psychologists, sometimes physiotherapists, and some people have financial difficulties, which it doesn't enable them to have the proper treatment that they have. Once someone lodges a claim, there's a whole new world that opens up to them. They have to navigate that system, new actors come into place, case managers, uh, new doctors, new healthcare providers. And the final moment, the matter is return to work. 
uh, a lot of people uh, don't understand the logics of returning to work. Can they return to work before they get completely uh, better from, from their injury? So lots of questions. So that's kind of what set up, uh, was the setup that we had to start. We had a mandate to implement the new technology with by building new products and services, but we wanted this mandate to be focused on people like Francis, making sure that that journey of recovery was safe and informed and she had enough support to go through that experience so that the things that we that we uh, saw wouldn't happen again so what we set out to do uh, once we kicked off this work uh, the first thing was to understand what that future of recovery would be like and we did that in a in a very um, practical way so we did a lot of research initially but we picked up those moments that matter one by one and started to design how this new digital experience could help the workers that we that we had uh, as part of our insurance scheme. So um, I have a few pieces of um, uh, some of the products that we that we developed, and I'll um, connect that to to the moments that matter that we found on on the research. The first one that that you can see here is what we call uh, a recovery plan. Recovery plan is a digital interface that allows workers, uh, healthcare providers, and employers to understand everything about a claim and recovery. In this case, what you can see here is the worker uh, recovery plan. And this piece of product, piece of experience, addresses uh, this that idea of navigating the scheme and understanding, or for example, what are you eligible to? What are your approved services? So if you have a back injury, how many sessions can you go to the physio? What's WorkSafe going to pay you? Uh, how treatment is going to look like? Um, another thing that we found was that people find really beneficial to hear stories from uh, uh, other workers that have been through the same journey. So what does return to work look like for someone that had a, uh, an injury similar to yours? And also, of course, adding... Um, uh, questions and answers and other things that are that are relevant for the person at that stage so he can self-manage his recovery. So this is very suitable for people that have had low complexity injuries. For people, for example, that had uh, more uh, severe injuries and they needed more hands-on support, we also look at how that experience could look like by putting the work at the center but connecting all those different actors. For example, uh, the, the employer, uh, the doctors, the physiotherapists, how they can all uh, be in the same page, enabled by technology, uh, but providing, putting the work at the center and focusing on the worker recovery and, and return to work. So we picked all those moments that matter, uh, developed prototypes, uh, tested those prototypes with uh, workers, injured workers, employers, and doctors. And then it was time for us to start uh, moving those um, products into uh, production and, and delivery. And what we did is that we put together a video connecting that vision uh, of what the recovery was going to look like in the future. Because although we design products with a human-centric perspective, it's very easy during design and even during delivery to lose track of what that experience would look like. So we uh, developed that video that was our, our way to communicate the human centricity of the product into the teams that were going to be working on building the technology and, and building uh, the product uh, uh, after us. So Isaac, if you could uh, please um, play the video, that would be awesome. WorkSafe's 2030 transformation and new digital technologies hold great potential for improving the experience and outcomes for our customers. The recovery journey is a key opportunity where we believe we can have an impact. To improve outcomes, workers need to be given guidance and to be given information when and where it's relevant. After a workover claim has been approved, the injured worker receives their personal recovery plan. This plan provides information on treatment, the services they have been approved for, and contact details for a crisis near their home. Our patients choose their preferred treater. 
and be able to play an active role in their recovery planning. The recovery plan connects the workers' care team together, providing new opportunities to coordinate the treatment approach. Through the WorkSafe portal, healthcare providers can instantly communicate with the team to ask questions, provide updates and keep everyone on the same page. The employer plays a key role in the workers' recovery and good communication is essential to planning a successful return to work. Employers receive their own kit to help them manage recovery. New channels make it easier to connect with the healthcare provider to identify how to help workers return to modified duties. It is important that our communication options fit into existing practices of our clients, helping them to spend less time worrying about the processes and more time focusing on getting back to work and returning to life. Whilst this ambition is still a work in progress, we now have even greater belief in the ideas behind the recovery plan and its potential to improve outcomes for the workers we support. Thanks, Isaac. I don't know if um, the video didn't uh, work this last part for me, but what we what we we showed there was uh, some of the prototypes that I showed before the connection between healthcare provider worker, employer, and how that whole experience can facilitate return to work in sometimes return to life when return to work uh, is not possible. So how does that actually work? So how our process work uh, to get you those uh, prototypes, to get you those products, and, and then to finally get you build. Uh, the, innovation, uh, the innovation team uh, works in multidisciplinary groups. So we have people, uh, a lot of designers, developers, researchers, uh, people with business background. And our responsibility is to bring products from concept development to what are called early build. And we don't uh, have a responsibility to deliver those products. And uh, the reason for this, I have a strong belief that it, we need a very different set of skills uh, from the work that we do at the moment that we, we usually refer to zero to one, like getting creating something out of nothing to then scale and deliver that product. We don't believe that the same skills. Of course, they are complementary skills, but we at the moment don't have the capability to scale products. So there's a specific team uh, that do that. And uh, the way that we operate is heavily based on human insights. We do a lot of research, extensive research, spend time interviewing, observing, doing uh, the same thing that workers do, uh, following that strategic direction of what's the priority for, for the business, uh, developing prototypes as soon as we can, sometimes even during research phase, so we can test quickly, learn, iterate, and increase the speed to creating minimum viable products. That, I don't think that's anything new. Uh, we follow basically the Lean Startup Religion, you know, the Butte Measure Learn Framework. Uh, so this is us, but what happens after it comes, uh, after we uh, have worked on the product? So our timeline looks roughly like this. We start in innovation with uh, the goal to develop rapid prototypes and confirm desirability. So we want to make sure that the people that we're going to be designing with and for uh, want that product. And we establish technical viability. So the screens that you saw before on the video and the prototypes, they had uh, input from uh, Salesforce experts. Salesforce is the platform that we that we're using as part of our transformation to understand first what you know what can this be done. We can't design something that can't be done. So uh, from you know if you're familiar with Salesforce, like are we using Health Cloud, Marketing Cloud, Communities, and even the layout of the page? How are we going to lay out those experiences? And what are the restrictions that we see uh, with Salesforce? data model so all of those things we consider but we put the client experience first we put the desirability first this usually takes us between two to three months depending on the complexity of the project that we the problem that we are working with and then we move the next step is going to pilot stage uh, pilot uh, for us the first pilot we call it recovery hub but it's a it's still under innovation guidance the, the goal here is to continue to mature 
uh, desirability and uh, the technology to progress that to a level of uh, proof of concept. But this time, instead of only talking to real clients, we do that in a real environment. We, talk, we, we limit this to 10 uh, clients with real claims. And the reason why we do this is because we want to make sure in the first place that we're not causing further harm. Although we have tested desirability, we want to see how that works in the, in, with the real claims. Uh, and we want to do that slowly because we are dealing with you know, people's lives and we want to make sure that we are mitigating uh, risk as much as possible. Once a product is successful, uh, in that stage, the next level is what I call model office, which is a much more robust pilot, still a pilot, but we now progress to having 600 claims uh, that are managed by uh, a much stronger operation. So we have a lot of case managers. We have now uh, product managers for each one of those initiatives that have been assigned, and they are now responsible for iterating uh, those products. And again, we're still testing a lot of the technology, the heavy technology, in this case, have not been built yet. We are going through the build stage, but we have a lot of foundational technology that we can use to um, uh, test some of the key experiences. And of course, at the end of um, of the of this series of tests, we want to make sure that we the hypothesis passed or failed, and they either going to go back to the model office so that the product managers and their team of uh, specialist designers and, and developers can tweak whatever we, we're developing, or they go back all the way to innovation so we can uh, re-understand uh, the problem. So um, it's, it's important that we, in our case, specifically in a heavy, heavy, heavily regulated environment where we're dealing with uh, quite complex issues, that we have this um, uh, a very cautious approach to rollout, but at the same time, this is a very iterative approach. So at every step here, you're going to see dozens, if not hundreds of iterations on the product, but maintaining the, the experience vision, maintaining the, the focus on the client. And the last example that I, I want to show you is uh, how we transition information. So this is a, an example one when we transition information from, uh, it might, might be a, a bit hard to read, but the, basically the anatomy of this um, transitioning information from uh, the recovery hub to model office is we show all the elements that the injured worker is going to be receiving. Uh, so you can see here. And then those blue boxes are basically why we have developed this. So we are communicating with the case managers that are going to be in touch with those uh, almost 600 claims and explaining to them why we have done that. So one example here is this block here talks about understanding your injury. So this is an email that we're uh, sending to the injured workers that they never received before to guide them through their recovery. To And this is our minimum viable product on that portal. So before having the portal, we started sending emails to understand if people were going to uh, engage with them and if the recovery is going to be improved. And in this block specifically, we're talking about an insight that we found out during research that workers wanted to understand more about their injury outside of the doctor's office. And we, and I think we all can relate to that. We usually go to Google to search for information and we said, okay, there, there might be better ways to talk about that injury, providing um, reliable sources about what's happening. So we added that to uh, this uh, recovery plan for the supported view. So in summary, uh, for us to adopt that um, uh, human-centric perspective, perspective to transformation, we had to build a, a, a process that was looking at mitigating risk as we progress the assumptions, but starting fundamentally with key moments that matter that were based on solid research and observation that we had done with workers, employers, and healthcare providers, so we could come to the development and the, the heavy technology phase with very strong validation that the products were uh, going to work with, um, with our, with our uh, clients. So um, thanks um, everyone for, for your time. Uh, if you wanna reach out, uh, more than happy to have a chat. My email is here. My, you can also reach out on Twitter if you think that's easier at Fabio SO. 
Uh, but I'm happy to take uh, a few questions. Thank you, Fabio, uh, for sharing those insights. It's really great to hear some of the work that you've been doing um, at WorkSafe Victoria and really adopting that client-centered design focus, which is really important to, I think, the crux of most organizations. So thank you so much for sharing that with us um, and the attendees today. It was really, really, really insightful. I actually do have a question for you. Uh, and it's actually a question I asked Michelle before, just to kick things off. And I just want to remind everyone that if you do have questions or anything you'd like to share or say um, or ask Fabio, please put them in the Q&A or the discussion forum and we'll get to them. But a question that I have for you is, what would you say your biggest successes have been over the last 12 months, um, particularly since COVID? And how are you looking to continue those successes moving forward? Yeah, we um one thing that was really important for us last year is uh, we had just started uh, a new team that was in, in the recovery space was in the community space, and we had to pivot uh, that the work that that team was doing to um, work with vulnerable communities, uh, and right because when COVID happened, we had to support some some uh, the communities in in a different way, uh, and uh, we we managed to develop. Uh, quite a few different tools focus on multicultural workers and how they can uh, prevent COVID in the workplace. And this is uh, a product that it, um, you know, was probably didn't follow all the rigidity that we had for recovery, but we're able to launch that pretty quickly with uh, the Department of Premier and Cabinet and uh, get distributed to a lot of different communities and industries that we end up finding in the second wave of COVID in July here in Victoria, that the vulnerable workers were the ones that were struggling the most. So uh, we are very proud of being able to, in a way, support workers that were going through that. Uh, at the, and, and, and it proved to us that, you know, even by having to focus on the short, short term, you can still do innovation. And that was, that was really good. Fantastic. And what's next for Works at Victoria? What are your next kind of goals that you'd like to kick um, in the next 12 months, particularly as we move into a post-COVID operating world um, that looks very different to what it might have looked like, say, 18 months ago, two years ago? What's what's next? Yeah, I think we, we still have a strong focus on delivering uh, this recovery uh, technology, the new recovery technologies more, now more than ever. We are seeing uh, a lot of, you know, an increase in mental health bigger than what we thought it, we would see. So we we want to see those new technologies coming come into place. But also, we understood a lot about how do, how those vulnerable workers, uh, uh, the cohort, uh, engages with WorkSafe, and it's something that we are working really hard on at the moment to make sure that uh, all the products that we're creating they are uh, accessible by everyone. Uh, and make sure that uh, you know all the workers that in Victoria can can benefit from health and safety as well. Yeah, absolutely. A question that I have is, what is your advice for other organisations who are looking to establish a very similar design model? Um, what would be your advice for first steps? I think the first step is recruitment and making sure that you have the right people. I think we we when we started hiring. Uh, in our team, we made sure that we had enough doers. Uh, a lot of designers from very different uh, schools of design. So we have, you know, we have graphic design, web, uh, industrial design, everything, uh, and developers, uh, because otherwise it's really hard to get stuff done. So my first advice would be recruitment, focus on getting people that can do uh, the work, and and then adopting um, a human-centric perspective would be my second um, advice. Great. Well, fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Fabio, for joining us this morning um, and sharing that with everyone. It was great to hear, and I really appreciate uh, having you involved, and I'm sure everyone who attended has as well. So thank you so much. Thanks, Isaac. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. So everyone, next step is to just move uh, into the next session uh, of the day. Uh, so just jump out of this one, jump into the next one like you did before, and we'll see you all there in a minute.